two of my daughters decided to watch the uh, Disney movies chronologically from the very beginning, like Steamboat Willie all the way through, documentaries and all, and uh, they're like uh, downstairs, and I can hear these things. One time, uh, it got me thinking about some of the Disney movies that I watched when I was growing up. One of them in particular had a story about uh, lemmings. Maybe you know what lemmings are. It was the, uh, the, you know, the white wilderness. It was a documentary, a nature documentary, and it had this story about lemmings in it. Lemmings are little cute, furry creatures that like each other a whole lot, and so sometimes they overpopulate. Um, and, so they, they, and when they overpopulate, the documentary says this, right? They, uh, they kind of get this big crowd, and they kind of lose it. They get frenetic and crazy and chaotic, and they just start running. And, so, and, and in the movie, they show this. It's kind of heartbreaking, right? Because these lemmings are in this, you know, this chaotic sort of frenzy, and they're running, and they're running toward a cliff. And the Disney, you know, people that are filming this, instead of, like, stopping them, are like, this will be great. And so they're filming this scene, and they're just lunging off of the cliff. And they, they end up in the water. And then the end of the scene is just like little, little lemmings floating in the water. Just, it was great. It was a heartwarming little nature documentary uh, about lemmings committing mass suicide. <clears throat> uh, yeah, good morning. Um, <laughs> the thing is, though, they lied. All right? Lemmings don't do this. Uh, they, the documentary was actually like herding the lemmings off of this cliff. Like they pull up a big dump truck full of lemmings, they empty it out near the cliff, and then they just film it. And so they lied to us. They lied to us. Disney lied to a little kid, and they used dead lemmings to do it. And that, oh, you guys, did I hear an awe? That was very sympathetic. I'm okay. I'm okay now. Um, the thing is... Today we want to talk about something called trust, and I think it's a huge deal. Um, if we don't have trust, then I think the we factor is going to be impossible. So welcome. My name is Lance. If you are a first-timer, if you're new here, welcome. So glad you made it. I uh, love you guys, and I know that you can be anywhere, and you chose to be here. So I want you to know that we do something called Q&R at the end, question and response. Um, if you have something that comes up in the sermon that you like, I need to ask about that. Download our app. You can ask it. I'll get to as many of them as I can. I do want to welcome in the online crowd. I want you to engage in the whatever, whether you're on YouTube or you're on Reality Church online. Uh, engage and ask questions. If you need prayer, let somebody know. We, we love it that you're engaging with us today. Um, we started out this series with a scripture that is Jesus' final prayer before he gets arrested. Jesus, this is pretty important because final words are important words. And Jesus, before he gets arrested, is praying to God. And he's praying, actually, for us. He's praying for those who will believe. He's actually praying for this room. And he says, way back 2,000 years ago, he says, Father, I in them, and that means that when you believe in Jesus, that he, he comes to reside in your life, I in them, and you and me, let me re reside in them in the same way that you reside in me. L let them be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you've sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus is saying 
that unity, that this we factor is really important because it shows the world that Jesus is who he says he is. It's very important. We changes us from the inside out, and we changes the world. That's, that's what we said. And last week we said that real, being real, being authentic, it breathes life into relationships. And if you're doing the opposite, your relationship is slowly dying. If you're being fake, you're, you're just getting worn out. If you're just projecting or trying to be somebody that you think that they would accept, your relationship is dying and you're dying on the inside. But there is a barrier to being real. There's one thing that can derail you being authentic. And you might have experienced it. I experienced it as a little kid with Disney. And it's called broken trust. Broken trust. You might be asking yourself the question, as you're moving through life, who can I trust? Because there's only really one way to know who you can trust, right? Ernest Hemingway said, the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. And then you'll find out. Everybody in this room, all of us, have been betrayed. And not one single person in here, if you're over the age of two probably, somebody told you they were going to do something and they didn't. And when that happens, when that happens to you, when it happens to me, it reframes everything. It makes us doubt almost everything. Everything that happened in the past is now run through the filter of this betrayal. It all looks different now. We, we, how could I have been so foolish? How could you have been so foolish? How did you believe them that that's, the way, that's what they were going to do or that's what they were, were going to follow through on? And so now you're asking the question, well, well who, who were you all that time? Because you weren't who I thought you were. And every time I thought I knew what was going on, I really didn't know what was going on. The painful part of that Maybe even the more painful part of that is I'm not who I thought I was. I thought I was somebody who knew who to trust. And now I'm looking back on me, and I'm like, who am I? Because my options are pretty negative, right? I'm either a naive loser or I'm a victim. I don't want to be either one of those. It can get really dark. And we end up, if that happens to us, and it has, we end up saying to ourselves, well, I'll tell you one thing right now. That's never going to happen again. I'm never going to let anybody in like that. I'm never going to trust anybody again. And things can get really cynical and bitter and pretty dark and get really dark, so dark that sometimes people never emerge from past hurt and past betrayal. I used to think, I've told you this before, I used to think that as you get older, you get sweeter and nicer because I, I, my family, all of the, all of the, like the, my grandparents and my great grand, you know, all of them were so sweet and so nice. So I thought that that's just the inevitable track, right? You just get older, you get sweeter. Have you ever been to like a, a assisted living facility? I've done ministry there. I have. It's not true, all right. Some of them are mean, like really, really mean. Here's what I think is true. I think there's a fork in the road for you and me, where we're making a choice, whether we're gonna move into life with trusting relationships or we're going to get dark and cynical and bitter. And what I'm hoping today is that we get honest with what, which one we're choosing and maybe change paths if we're choosing the wrong one. I hope you guys can see that the alternative of just never trusting anybody is not an effective alternative. There's no other way to do life. But if you're going to live authentically, if you're going to be real with someone, you have to build it on trust. We have to build our relationships on trust. Trust has to do with believing that something is solid, that it's enduring. You're currently trusting in your, in your seat that you're sitting in. Um, that seat has been a support to you in times past, and you believe it's going to support you in the future. Um, <clears throat> trust opens the door to two things that you and I need. Here's the two things that everybody in this room needs. We need support. We need people to be there who are going to really be there for us, right in the middle of all the stuff that happens in life. But that's not the only thing we need. You and I need challenge. We need someone who is going to move into our life, help us see things that we don't want to see, help us hear things that we don't want to hear. And you might say, Lance, but this is church, right? I trust in Jesus, Jesus is my friend. 
Jesus is the only one that I really need. Yeah, it's true. Jesus is your friend. He's your forever friend. But as your friend, Jesus wants you to know this. You need other friends. You need to have other people in your life. And he wants you to have that. He wants you to be supported. That's why he gave us the church. Not this building. Not just the people around you. That's the church. And he gave you those people because he knows that you need to be supported and you need to be challenged. That's... That's why I think because you need it so much, because it's the only way you're ever going to become who God had in mind when he created you, that's why there is such an attack on relationships. That's why you see stuff like disloyalty or uh, disunity or drama. You see all that stuff because, and betrayal, you see that because the enemy knows that if you have healthy relationships... That if you're if you're like your life is focused on Christ and you're authentically living in relationship, then you're going to make a big difference in the world. So he attacks your relationships. He throws darts at your relationships because he knows that that attack might derail your impact in the world. So <clears throat> it, it's under that attack, knowing that he's attacking. What can seal off the relationship to those attacks? Well, I think it's trust. Giving trust to someone who enables you to feel the support that you need to feel and to help you to accept the challenge that you need to accept. Now, let's start with support because there's going to be times in your life where you're going to lose, where you're going to be confused, where you're, maybe you go bankrupt or you lose the job or, the, or the, the divorce happens and you didn't want it to happen and you're just going to be crushed Everything has gone wrong. Your whole world is rocked. And at that moment, look around. Because that's the moment that you need, uh, you need support. This is a theme in music in pop culture. It's, it's funny. As I was looking at music, I was thinking, how many songs are about, hey, man, I've got your back? So many of them. You guys remember Bridge Over Troubled Water? Beautiful song by Simon and Garfunkel, where they were hopefully saying to each other, I'm always going to be there for you, bro. And then, of course, uh, they broke up and never got back together. (laughs) Regardless, uh, Count on Me by Bruno Mars. Uh, You Got a Friend. Carol King wrote that beautiful song. James Taylor covered it. Uh, And my favorite, I'll Stand By You by The Pretenders. Just a great song. Um, But but when you look at culture, it tells you what kind of questions culture is asking. And I think one of the questions culture is asking is, is there anybody out there that's going to be there for me when everything else is going wrong? And Scripture talks about this a ton. Um, Proverbs 17. A friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. And the actual um, Hebrew there is actually about adversity. Or like when there's an attack, when everything is is looking like it's not going to go well, that's what a brother is born for. That's what a friend is there for. You need someone who's going to be there because there's going to be times when things turn south for you. Sometimes it's easy to be your friend. When the bank account is full and, you know, you got a nice car or everybody loves you, then it's really cool to scoot up next to you and say, this is my, this is my bro, this is, this is my person, this is my bestie. Ooh, I died a little inside saying that, but... Uh, <laughs> This is the person that I, that I love. But guess what? It's not always going to be easy to be your friend. Your popularity is going to go down. It's going to hit an all-time low. Your reputation might be attacked publicly. Look around when that happens because that is a friend identifier. When it's not easy to be your friend, when, it's, when there is nothing to be gained by a relationship with you, look around. Those are the people that you can trust. Who's in your corner? Martin Luther King said it this way when he's talking about the civil rights movement. He looked around and he said, and in the end we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. There's going to be times when it's not, not going to be easy to name you as a friend. That's a friend identifier. I, have a, I had a really good friend in student ministry. His name was Jason, and he was actually reaching out to this family, uh, kind of cat corner next to his house. And he went over there, and this guy always had people over at his house. 
And Jason and Rachel, his wife, would go over there, and they were trying to reach out, tell them about Jesus. And this guy always had a big crowd. And the one time Jason and Rachel and this couple were there, and they were alone, and the guy said, I'm lonely. And Jason said, are you kidding me? I mean, you guys, uh, there's always something going on over here. He said, yeah, I don't know, man. I just, I just want to have friends that stick around when the beer runs out. And I think, I think that's what everybody's looking for. When there's nothing to be gained, when there's nothing there, and they stick around. Because there's going to be a battle that you and I are going to face, and it's those, those are the people that you can trust. Ecclesiastes says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, you can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. This is actually a picture of a battle where you're fighting. And, and when you're fighting alone, the tendency is just to give up. But when you've got someone with you, the tendency is to just keep going. You've got somebody there. The picture is like a battle that, you, that everybody faces. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's a career where, you, man, it's awful. When you're in your career and you're making the right choice and you feel like nobody is there with you, you are alone. And there's like all, everybody else, and then you're like, but this is the way things are ought to be, and you got nobody there with you. Oh, that can be so horrible. In marriage, if you feel like you're the only one working on the marriage, in parenting, if you feel isolated, man, the tendency is just to give up. In, in addiction, you know, people don't usually beat addiction on their own. They don't just wake up in the morning and go, I'm done with that. They need people around them to support them through that, that battle. It matters. To knowing that you're not alone matters. This can be like simple, like a text or a phone call or a meal brought to someone. God designed you and me to be in relationship because he knows that we need each other and he gives us the gift of the church. Uh, that puts the glue on relationships like nothing else. It seals it off when you know that there's someone who's going to be there for you when there's nothing to benefit from being there for you. And here's, how, here's another way you can know that you can trust somebody. Listen to this from Romans. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a relationship where every time you bring up anything about your life, it's just the launching pad for their story that is slightly cooler than yours? Anybody had that experience? I had a friend who used to say, that's nothing, after I would tell a story. That's great, yeah. Oh, sorry for wasting your time there with my story. Yeah, that's nothing. Listen to this. That's an awful thing to say to somebody. If you can be around somebody that when you're sad, they're just plain old sad with you. They just say, yeah, that, that's, that's awful. And they just sit in the mud with you, and they let you determine whether it's time to get out of the mud or not. They just sit there with you. They, they can weep with you. That's empathy. They are feeling as best as they can what you're feeling. And when you tell them something awesome, they aren't telling you about something cooler that happened to them. They are actually, if they tell you, here, here's the thing, you tell them something awesome that happened to you, and they're genuinely happy for you. They're not jealous of you. They're not thinking of something like that that happened to them. Maybe they are, but they're not talking about it. They want to give the moment to you. You need support like that. You all, the, those first phone calls or those first, first texts when something awesome, the, the, the impulse to text them should tell you something. This person knows how to be with me instead of being in competition with me or being jealous of me. That You need people that will support you. That's not all we need, though. You and I don't just need support. If you only have people in your life and the only thing they do for you is support you in whatever decision you make... That's not good. You need people who will challenge you. Because here's the deal. You need people who, we need people who believe in us, but who also see what we can be. We also, who also see how you're getting in your own way and can deliver that truth to you. There's tons of songs about this as well. Obviously, I love music. There's Brave by Sarah Bareilles. There's Shake It Out by a great song by Florence and the Machine. Back when I was in high school, there was a song called Hold On by Wilson Phillips. Um, the Climb by Miley Cyrus, uh, Hero by Mariah Carey, and Defy, Defying Gravity by, by Broadway, Adina Menzel. 
Why, why do these songs, I mean, I love, if, if, if I'm like driving down the road and one of these songs like, yeah, baby, you're a firework, and I'm like, I'm singing that, right? I, not, I can't hit everything on it. But I, why, why do those songs just like infuse us with like hope? Like, yeah, things can get better. I can do this thing. It's a, it, it ain't about how, well, I can't remember the lyrics to the climb. Whatever, it's the climb. And I love those songs, and so do you. But you need people that aren't just singing to you. You, know? you need people that are right in front of you who know what you need to hear, who can coach you, and who can believe in you at the same time. As iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27 says, so a friend sharpens a friend. You need people in your life who want the best for you. It's a good thing to invest your life in people who believe you can be better. It's really a good thing to move away from people that drag you down, that don't believe the best about you or don't want the best for you. See, when sparks fly between friends, that's not necessarily a bad thing. When sparks fly between friends, those sparks should be making each person sharper. Our friends shouldn't blunt our strengths or seek to blunt our strengths. Our friends ought to give us an edge. When you're spending a, a quantity of time around somebody and you come away from that time and your gifts or your skills or your belief or your hope or your faith has been blunted, that's not a good friendship. You ought to sharpen each other. You ought to walk away with an edge. You ought to walk away with a, a deeper knowledge maybe of who God called you to be or what God kind of told you to do or, or could do through you. That's, that takes someone who is willing to take a big risk and that's telling you the truth. Ephesians 4 says, instead of just kind of playing it safe, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. That seems to mean, like if you don't have people in your life that are speaking the truth in love to you, you're probably not growing in maturity more and more like Christ. Because we don't grow in maturity into the image that Christ has for us just on our own in a cave somewhere. God designed it to where you and I, we, we would need each other. And man, don't we? Don't we just need each other? There's plenty I don't know about me. And I need someone who sees the truth about me and loves me anyway. There's plenty you don't know about you. And you need someone in your life who sees it and loves you. Maturity is on the other side of letting myself be coached. Maturity is on the other side of letting myself be mentored. Maturity is on the other side of me letting myself be challenged. And when nobody in your life is challenging you, I promise you, you're not growing. I have a friend who's a coach. He's a basketball coach. And, and one of the things he says to the team is, hey, worry when we're not coaching you. Because really what that means, that's a message that says, I really don't believe you could get any better. You're probably, you're probably about as good as you can get. But when you're being coached, somebody is looking you in the eyes and saying, I think, I think you could be better. I believe in you. Um, in order for that to work, though, I have to know. In order for that to work for you, you have to know a few things about those people. In order for that to work for me, I have to know a few things. Number one, I need to ask the question, are you for me? Because there's plenty of people that want to tell you truth, and they're not for you. They're wanting to tell you truth, not to build you up. They want to tell you truth in order to break you down. They want to move into your life and tell you all the flaws that you have in order so that they can feel a little bit better than you. So the first question to ask yourself and them, are you for me? Are you on my team? Because uh, I do remember a, a time in a, in a, it was a football game, I think, and uh, there was one of our wide receivers. I played a trumpet in football. Um, <laughs> So one of our wide receivers had gone out for a pass, and, and he, had, he had let the ball slip through his fingers, and it's because there was somebody running at him, and, and uh, the coach was saying, hey, watch, he brought him over and said, hey, watch the ball all the way into your hands. You've got to watch the ball all the way into your hands, and that's coaching. Now, that's a great message, but if it came from the opposite sideline, and somebody else is going, watch the ball all the way into your hands. It's a total different message. It's a completely different deal. Are you for me? Are you on my team? Because I can hear it from somebody who's for me. Next thing is, do you know what you're talking about? 
If, if, if I, playing trumpet, was saying, watch the ball all the way in your hands, he's like, yeah, I don't listen to you. <laughs> all right? If you were talking about how to hit a B flat, I would listen to you, but you don't know about this. Do you know what you're talking about? And, this, and the last thing is, and this is big, are you willing for me to speak into your life? I mean, if you're, the, if you're the Messiah and I'm the one who's getting saved here all the time, if you're the helper and I'm the helped all the time, like I've got nothing to add to this relationship, then one of us is not needed. Are you willing for me to speak into your life? I need all three of those things. That's what trusting authentic relationships look like. That's what trust looks like. That's how you build it. Um, and if, you, if I've got those three things then, then I'll, I'll let them speak into my life. And I need that. You need that. And not only that, you need to help people who are headed toward like painful circumstances. You've got to get over this uncomfortable conversation and just say the truth to people. Here's what Hebrews says about that. You must warn each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. The, the implication here is that you can get some patterns into your life. You can get some things that you start doing and you get numb to them. Like it doesn't bother you anymore. You need somebody in your life that it does bother. You need somebody that sees what's going on, knows that the bridge is out, and you're driving towards it, and has the uncomfortable conversation. Listen, this is going to end up poorly. You always want those people because when it's all over, then you wish they had talked to you a little bit sooner. I was riding, when I first got into ministry, I was a little intimidated by the lead pastor, the senior pastor. I was I was a youth pastor, and I was driving down the road with Bill Holmes, and he had actually turned, and there was some construction going on. There were some pylons there, and he turned onto the road, and he was going the wrong way. I was in the passenger seat, and I'm very intimidated by him, and I like him, but I'm intimidated, and there's a car coming at us, and I'm, guy, I'm trying to make a decision in my mind. I'm like, how do I correct this guy? And so I say pretty quietly, oh, there's a car, a car up there, you know, and... and and he's telling a story to me. So, and he's really animated. And he's telling it like it's a funny story. And so, like, so anyway, I tell him, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, and whatever it was, I was just like, okay, all right, just wait for another moment when, he, when there's a break. Yeah, there's a car up there. And, and I said it like that. And it was, it was getting gradually louder, and, but I was panicking. And it finally got to the point where he was still looking over at me. And I said, I'm going to get out of there. We're all going to die. <laughs> and, uh, and he swerves over these pylons, and then we're on this rough side of the road, and he stops, and he looks over at me and said, yeah, yeah, next time tell me sooner, okay? <laughs> and, that's, and that's funny until we realize that there are people in our lives that when the whole thing gets wrecked, they could look over at us and say, why didn't you tell me sooner? Why didn't you tell me this was coming? Why didn't you have the uncomfortable conversation with me? Because wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Those wounds, not knowing is, is not kind. I mean, American Idol tryouts are proof that some people walk around with a false view of themselves. It's not kind to ignore what may damage someone in the future. It's not kind to flatter someone so that you can remain comfortable. The sincere truth told in a compassionate way is still going to wound. So if your goal is to never wound anybody with your words, then you're never going to tell even a compassionate truth. Because even if somebody tells me the truth in a compassionate way, i got to be honest with you, it's still, it still smarts. I don't like it. But it's a wound like a, a surgical scar, necessary and a reminder of something that needed to be addressed. The kisses of an enemy, on the other hand, they result in a knife scar as well, but it's a blade to the back in the dark. So learn to trust the wounds of a friend. And when you do, the seal between you, the trust, it, it gets even stronger. So strong that you don't have to wait on them to tell you maybe some things that need to be addressed. 
you get to the point where you can do this. What James says, you can confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You can get to the point where you trust someone to the degree that you go, you know, I, I, we, we know each other so well. I know you're broken. Guess what? Here's another broken part of me. I'm going to confess this. Let's look at it together. Let's agree with God about this together so that I can be healed because I, this, is, this is a wound. It's an open wound, and I need to find healing from this. There's something beautiful about confession. It's like what happens when we do communion because communion is a confession in a way. It's a confession that we couldn't fix in ourselves what only Christ could fix. And so anytime you confess, it's like saying, I don't have it all together. It's an admission that we, all of us, need a sacrifice on our behalf. There should be a willingness to confess sin to not everybody, but to somebody and pray because we know that every one of us in this room has old patterns, destructive habits, unhelpful ways of relating to people, and in the confessing, the illusion of having it all together goes away. Also, the illusion of you having it all together goes away. Because we're all just admitting, you know what, I, I need Christ. I can't do this on my own. The focus shifts from us to Jesus himself. Long term, guys, you're never really going to breathe life into your relationships by being real until you decide to trust and once that relationship, one, and maybe you have these, is sealed by mutual trust, then you and I can become who we were designed to be. And I know that in this room, you're probably finding yourself in one of two places when it comes to trust. You're looking to maintain trust. You're looking to, you've got a healthy relationship, and you're like, how can we build on this? How can we maintain it? Because it's really not static. It can erode. But some of you guys are coming from a place where you're walking through the wreckage of broken trust, and you're wondering, can this ever be restored? Well, let's, let's repeat what trust does. Trust seals our relationships. So if you want to maintain trust, here's, here's one thing you can do. <clears throat> uh, John Gottman, who has studied relationships for so many years, he says that in every relationship there are sliding door moments. And he, he named it after the movie Sliding Doors where everything kind of hinges on that moment. It seems like a small thing, but it's actually it's going to matter. And these moments are when you, you reach out to whoever it is that you love, whoever you're, you're in a relationship with, and you're reaching out to them and you're asking them to, to approach you, to walk towards you. It could be as simple as look at that squirrel playing in the tree. And, that, and then your, 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 your spouse just doesn't, you know, just continues reading the book or whatever and ignores you. That seems like a small, and it is, it's a small moment, but those small moments add up so that they've studied couples. And if they witness a couple ignoring each other's bids for attention, they can predict that that relationship will break up. And that's in every relationship. You've got these moments, these sliding door moments. And what John Gottman says, he used someone else's work here, but he says we should be attuned to each other. We should be aware. What are they saying? What are they, what are they wanting right now? When you walk into the room and they're sad, and we've got a choice at that moment, right? They're sad. They're obviously sad. You could do what I have a tendency to do. Oh, that looks like an emotional chasm that I don't want to jump down into. Oh, my gosh, I'm scared to death. I have no idea how deep that goes. Or I could approach. So aware and then turn toward. And then tolerance. Tolerance of what? Tolerance of perspectives or, um, or emotions or, or, you know, ideas that you don't agree with. Just, just to sit there for a while and tolerate the fact that this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me, and sometimes I'm even the, the, the object of the um, discomfort. Understanding. How do you understand? You listen and you clarify. I've, if I'm going to be attuned to you, I can't just come at you with the ideas of what I think you're thinking. This is a scriptural idea of just being curious with someone. I want to understand. I want to clarify and then non-defensive responding. I'm not sure non-defensive is a word, but still, 
Um, it had a, a red line underneath it. But what I, what I think here is sometimes it's about me. And I need to really, in, an, in a non-defensive way, respond. Here's, okay, I, I get it. And then empathy. If you've done all of this, then by the end, that empathy, you're feeling as best you can kind of what they're feeling. That's how you maintain trust. In those little small moments, you stay attuned. What are they doing? And if you've got a healthy relationship, then you need to, to work through that. That's the way we love each other. But if, you've, but if trust has been broken, if you are looking to restore trust, well, let's start with the belief that people can change because I think we write people off too soon. I know that there are toxic relationships. I know that there are people that you're never going to reconcile with. I would argue that those are the minority, and we, and we put almost everybody in that group. When, we, when it makes us too uncomfortable to move toward them, we put them in that group. There are those, and I don't want to discount those, but it's not everybody. So here's what you do when you want to restore, restore trust. Believe that they can change. Um, give them grace. Grace is the space that gives them um, to, that, that you give them to grow into who God is making them into. And how do you do that? Um, number one, communication. Usually when someone breaks trust, what do we do? We cut off communication. And, but if you want to restore it, you're going to have to heighten communication, both in frequency and duration. It's a lot of work. Is the relationship wor worth it? That's up to you. This is a high-stakes relationship, and you say, I'm going to up the communication. I'm going to, I'm going to really, really lean into this. And then agreement, and this is really hard work, where both of the people, or a group of people maybe, have to agree on what happened and what needs to change, and that is not easy because hardly anyone agrees on what happened and what needs to change. So doing the hard work of, of getting to the point where you, both people are saying, yeah, that, that's it, that's what, need, that's what needs to be fixed. And then positive. And that stands for, let me go back to agreement. Sometimes it's helpful to write the agreement down. What, what, need, what happened, what needs to change, and here's how we're going to change it. And the reason is because how many of you guys have ever been in a relationship where you guys agreed to something verbally and then it got twisted and turned like the next conversation that you had? Sometimes, it's, it's not saying I don't trust you. It's saying let's trust each other here to maybe sometimes write it down. And then a positive. You need to maintain a positive story about each other. So easy to pick out what's wrong with people. So easy. Because there's, you can find enough wrong things about anybody. I used to say, if you put the microscope on my life looking for um, things wrong with me, you're going to find microscopes aren't necessary. You, there's plenty. There's just plenty. Your negative story, though, can hold them back from changing because they feel like they can't break out of the pattern. And God doesn't treat us that way. And we ought not treat other people that way. Um, okay, guys, I've... Um, I've, I've gone way over. I'm blaming the loss of an hour's sleep. Um, one more hour of sunlight today. That's really good. Um, so let's look and see whether you guys have any questions. What do you do when a family member, sibling, or parent doesn't have your back and is always all about them? Or you've told them time and time again that they're headed in the wrong direction, yet they continue down the same path. How do you know when to draw the line in that relationship? Um, one thing I want to always keep all of us, in, and we need to keep this in mind, we can't fix anybody. Um, we can't, if there's no easy button when it comes to relationships where you go, ah, here, I've identified what you need to change. Uh, now you're going to change that, and we're all going to be happy. There's no easy button. There's no, like, control pad. There's no remote control for anybody. Let me illustrate it this way. How good are you at changing you? And now you're wanting to waltz into someone else's life and change them for the better? Yeah, probably not. Uh, in other words, I've, the, the bad news is that you're responsible for what you're bringing and not for what they're doing with what you're bringing, right? You, you're still, you and I, we're all still responsible for telling the truth in love. Um, we're still responsible for compassionately giving somebody grace, for believing the best about them. That's our responsibility. Is that open to abuse? Yeah. 
that grace always leaves itself open to abuse. That's the position of grace. That's the way God approaches me. And i got to be honest with you, I have, I've abused it at times. And so I think that frustration is common. And I also want to tell you this. Um, you probably need people around you. Not, not so you can talk negatively about this family member. You, you need to drop that. But who can support you in, in that frustration. Um, and, you, you know, there's wisdom in how we tell people they're headed down the wrong path, too. I hope, I hope we kind of covered that. Because trust is built when we tell that in a compassionate way, in a way that's for them. But you can't, you just can't fix people. You can't change people. You don't even have the power to change yourself. And so what we do is... One, one, the biggest thing that I would tell you to do is a very powerful thing that I think we don't think about very often is we just talk to God about them. Talk to God about them. Not other people. Don't invite your friend over to coffee and talk bad about your family members. But instead, talk to God about them and love them and, and, and seek their best and see what God does. It's, sometimes it's a long, long road. My counselor once told me that, long, that long-term resentment affects how we perceive the intentions of others. How does this play into trusting others? Well, wow, that's a wise counselor. I think that, that you're, the way you perceive the, um, the, the way that you perceive yourself is even affected by this. Long-term resentment can make you small. Like, I don't deserve very much, or I don't, I, I guess I'm just a loser. Lifelong resentment can change how you think about even strangers, how you approach life. And so you've got to kill that lifelong resentment. We're going to talk next week about forgiveness, what it is, what it's not, how if you don't have it, you, none of this other stuff works. Um, and I think it is the key, letting go of long-term resentment, letting go of cynicism and bitterness is the key. To, ha- to being free to live and love like Christ. What else? Where's the line between people's actions versus giving grace? You can't keep giving grace for repeated actions that violate trust, right? Yes, you can. In fact, that is the position of grace. Yes, you can. We don't like to hear this part. But we just keep giving grace. We just keep giving grace. Well, that, that, that makes me a doormat. No, you don't have to reside in the same space as them in order to give grace. There are, there are relationships where you're, when you're giving somebody space to grow into who they need to be, you don't have to be in that zip code. You, you can give people grace and not be bitter and not be cynical and have moved away from them physically and not placed yourself under whatever it is that's emotionally damaging to you or physically damaging to you, don't be around. That's not really loving yourself. And Jesus commands us to love ourselves. We've got to love ourselves in order to be free to love other people. But we do continue to give grace. Because why? Well, because God continually gives me grace. And and since he does... I need to remember that whatever role they're playing in my life, and this is painful to to hear, whatever role they're playing in my life, I've probably played that role in someone else's life. And I really want them to give me grace. There's this equalizer called the cross. And the cross tells us all that our life demanded death to pay for our sins. Our life. Not somebody else's life that's really worse than us, but ours. So um, I, I, I hear the spirit of your question, though, and it's this. Um, do I have to be a doormat for somebody? Do I have to submit to abuse? And if that's your question, then the answer is no. That's not how you love yourself. But that doesn't, that doesn't stop us from giving grace, even from people that have done the exact wrong thing with us. Even in the case of abuse, you can give grace and forgiveness and move away. In fact, I think that's the that's the position of the Christian. So we'll see what else. How can you trust in someone when you have been betrayed by all your friends? 
What does the healing process look like and how can I start trusting again? Hmm. I hope that you're here today, um, and if you are, you're probably seated around people that if they knew your story, would, would be there for you, like, like with a physical hug. I can't imagine being betrayed by all your friends. That story that you just kind of laid down in one sentence, to me, is devastating. I can't, I can't wrap my head around all of your friends betraying you. If that has happened to you, I really sincerely think you need to approach somebody here and say, look, this is, I'm, I'm crushed. Because I, I think that our hearts can't really take that kind of stuff. And th- that's, why we ha- that's why we're here for each other. There's going to be people over here on the right and left that, that can pray. Uh, approach them. If you're online and that's your question, then ask somebody to pray for you and let it not just be one prayer, but you need to have some people around you right now because you're going to be you're going to really be struggling with trust if this has happened to you. Um, that healing process looks like having people in your life that you can trust. I think this kind of illustrates for all of us that this isn't casual, that we can't just play at relationships. There are people out there, maybe in this room, who have had their whole world just crushed. What do you do in that case? And I think, hopefully, if you're a believer in the room, your heart is you want to move towards them. You want to show them the love of Christ. You want to show them what grace looks like. You want to show them what trust looks like with integrity. So I hope that you can reach out to somebody and, and not just let this um, kind of continue, uh, that wound still be open in your, in your life. Do you think trust gets messy when we want people to do what we imagine in our minds rather than their unique way of being in the world? Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I think sometimes this happens in parenting relationships where you kind of have a dream for your kid and uh, you keep on speaking into their life, uh, coaching them in that direction, and you find out, you know, uh, that's not the direction they want to go or need to go or were designed to go. Uh, and I think that can break down trust. It's, it can get really complicated um, and messy, But can't we just admit that relationships are messy in the first place? That's what they are. Relationships are messy and it's two broken people and we're really not going to meet each other's core needs. We get our needs met by Jesus instead of that other person. So it's always going to be a little messy. Um, I really appreciate the questions, guys. Um, I'm going to, we are, this is an exciting week for Reality Church. Very exciting. very exciting week because we are going to travel. All of us are traveling, in a sense, down to Belize. I'm going to ask the Belize team to come on up here. Give them a hand as they're walking up here. All right. Thank you so much. There's a... Oh, two rows. Okay. Oh, come to the light. Walk towards the light. All right, so, um, but don't follow each other other over the edge. Um, So there's a lot of trust on this stage. There are some that are taking a mission trip for the first time. And, uh, yeah, that's quite a leap of faith. Um, Our our church, Roger, um, Roger back there in the back, uh, there he is. Roger, um, we went through a really rough time with, with missions. We had, we had some pretty devastating stuff happen in, in missions and what we're doing ar- around the world. And, and Roger, uh, just like he always does, just kind of puts his nose down and, and starts working and finding and, um, and connected us with Belize. And uh, I think that the, the, this is the result of all of that, that we're continuing to, to see what Jesus can do through us found a church in Kings Park, Kings Park Church. We're going to be partnering with the church. We're not going down there to help them. We're going to end up, well, we are helping them, but they're going to help us. This is, this is the, the church of Jesus Christ kind of working together. So there's also a lot of trust from them to you because we promised that we were going to pray for them. This week, some of you guys wrote your name down, and you picked out somebody and said, I'm going to pray for them. 
and I did that. So we're going we're gonna to pray for them this week. And guys, we're trusting you. We're trusting you that when you go there, you're going to represent Jesus Christ, that you're going to work with everything you've got. You're going to support each other. You're going to stay unified. That drama will be kept to a minimum, you know, well, it, because if you really want to know somebody, go on a mission trip with them. Then you'll, you'll really know them at the end. So we want to take this time to pray for you guys as a church and send you off with God's blessing. Let's pray together. Father, you already know what's going to happen. You're, you're, I pray that you prepare hearts at, at Kings Park. God, I pray that you would make the way smooth, that you would amaze us with your work. We just, we just want to submit this trip to you. We want to submit these lives to you. Father, may, may someone come to faith in you because of this trip. May someone get a renewed vision for what you're doing globally because of this. God, I pray that as we trust in you supremely over everything else, that we'll also grow in strong and sealed relationships with each other. Bless this trip to Belize. Bless each individual on the trip. May they find out why they're going. And may our church hear the incredible stories when they get back. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.